I killed three people last night. The first one was actually an accident. I was out trying to get a smoke when I saw them coming through the gate. Caught me off guard and I filled them with bullets. As soon as it happened, I regretted it. Not because of killing them, but because of the issues it would cause. I pride myself with running a tight ship. You have to when you're in the business I'm running. I ran the options through my head as quickly as the man hit the ground. Then I remembered I had just checked in a starving werewolf family. I called my head of housekeeping, Jerome, and explained the situation. What room did you put them in? I asked. 478. I memorized it and rode the elevator to the correct floor. It was midway to the door when I had a buzz on my phone. There was a problem at the pool. Mermaid hair had clogged up the drains. I said a few things I shouldn't have under my breath and buzzed the door for my guest to answer. The father answered, looking visibly exhausted as he had likely just finished his metamorphism back to human form. Mr. Sharp, is everything all right? I told the kids to keep the howling down. It's nothing like that. I remembered when you checked in that you said your kids hadn't had a bite to eat. Well, something just came up that might help curb the appetite, I told him. Fifteen minutes later, his three children were hunched over the man in my front driveway, grabbing his meaty portions with their teeth as blood covered their tiny bodies. It was sickening to watch, but I wanted to make sure that they didn't leave a single scrap behind. The way the bones crunched, I closed my eyes and thought of all the different times I had to do something like this. It frightened me how normal it was now. Once the were children were done, I returned to my front lobby and made a few phone calls. Security is my top priority here, and I figured that if someone had managed to get into the gate without a pass, I had a problem. I found out what that problem was about five hours later when Jerome and I did a customary perimeter sweep. Checking the force field was mundane, but when we made it to the basement, I couldn't help but to notice that several of the vents had been loosened. Someone is trying to bring in contraband, I told my friend, thinking of how annoying it was when my guests didn't obey rules. We'll need to do a complete sweep of the manor, room to room. We can't have something blowing up in our faces like last time, I said as I took out my cell and punched in a number for security. Jerome stood there stone-faced. Did you not hear me? We need to get moving, I said, and then froze, realizing that the room felt off. This wasn't the basement. The carpeting was wrong. I slowly placed my cell phone back in my pocket and reached for my weapon, unsure of what I was facing. Jerome's mouth opened wide as I prepared to fire and a heavy shriek came from his inner vocal cords. I was floored immediately, the gun firing randomly as the massive sound wave crippled me. Gradually the room faded away and I realized that I had been duped. This wasn't my housekeeper at all, it was a damn alp. I frantically reached for my weapon, ready to fire at it as the nightmarish creature shed its false skin and crawled the cave toward me. This had to be how the security system had been breached. Go back to hell, you bloody dream snatcher, I said, raising the gun toward it and blasting at its shoulders. The creature shrieked again, and I realized that it wasn't alone. As if one damn demon wasn't bad enough, the Alp had been smart and brought a banshee along for the ride. That explained the damn ringing in my ear. I stumbled to my feet, trying to avoid the swipes of the creature's front claws as I activated an emergency beacon on my phone and pulled out my secondary weapon. Fucking hell, I hate Mondays, I snarled as I unsheathed the long blade and ran it through the second target. The banshee made one last guttural sound as it died, spitting out blood and mucus on my finely pressed suit as I shuddered and looked toward the Alp. The cave was still shimmering ever so slightly with the magic binding that had caused me to hallucinate, and it was difficult to be sure exactly where the target was. And then before I knew it, the demon was right on top of me. Its neck elongated and stretched toward me, twisting around to widen its mouth and swallow me whole. I frantically and desperately stabbed at the creature, not sure if I was actually attacking it or merely the air. But I did everything I could to fight for my life as I waited for backup. Then the demon smashed its foreleg into my neck and crushed my windpipe. I could feel myself starting to gasp for air as I slit its throat, causing the Alp to collapse on top of me. Its heavy body made it impossible for me to move. I was still struggling to breathe when Jerome, the real Jerome, that is, showed up alongside two of my security officers. They used their combined strength to move the horse-headed fiend off me and Jerome checked my injuries. Tell it to me straight, I said as I swallowed my own blood. I was fading in and out of consciousness. He didn't have to really explain what was going to happen next, but I still dreaded it. He took out a long silver-coated dagger and told me to close my eyes. 
I'm not sure why, but I resisted the order and instead watched as he plunged the steel into my heart. Darkness took over shortly after that. When I woke up, I was in my private antechamber in a vat of goo in a new body at that. Jerome was checking my vitals as the water cleared from my lungs and I looked at the markings on my body. How long was I dead that time? I asked as I rubbed the scratch that had magically appeared on my back. 23. I was already on the fucking 23rd time of this shit. I realized as Jerome checked his data. 17 minutes, sir, he said as he went over to the next cylinder and tapped it. I grabbed a towel and stared at the formless body that I was likely going to be in next time. Can we try to make this one a little bit more muscular? I sneered as I shook off the cold sweat that death often brought. Jerome gave me a look that told me I needed to be thankful for what I got and then reminded me that I had other pressing matters to catch up on. Any word on where the demons came from? How they got in? Were any of the guests hurt? Unfortunately, no, sir, and that is what troubles me the most. For the first time in quite a while, we have a blank in our history, he answered. My eye twitched as I struggled to remember the swirling memories of all my past lives. I've dealt with situations as dire as this before, but it can be difficult to muddle through them once you've been out a few times. You're telling me that we might be compromised, I said, trying my best to not let my fear show. But then he said something that made the other shoe drop. I never said the word might, sir. I said we are. All I could think of was how shitty and dreadful the rest of the work week was going to be, and whether I would have to harvest a few more bodies just to survive it all. Mondays fucking suck, and this one is just the start of a new nightmare. My security director just killed over. Shit. It started in the banquet hall. I had asked him to come meet me and discuss plans to beef up our protection after a recent mishap that had me worried about the integrity of the entire system. Sean is a nice guy. I've only had him on the crew for about three cycles now, but he is a bit too optimistic. Doesn't realize just how nasty this job is. We pride ourselves with keeping our guests safe no matter how long they have to stay, Sean. Do you understand what I'm saying? I asked as we went down the cafeteria aisle. At the time of the incident, our capacity was nearly 300 and rising. Apparently, there had been a recent uprising in a neighboring country, and a large nest of vampires came seeking shelter. To say they were hostile upon arriving was an understatement. Everywhere we looked, covens were fighting each other, either for some former sense of status or just a sense of control. Sean insisted he could handle matters, but it's always been difficult to keep the guests tamed comes with the territory, that's what Margarita would say if she was still alive. She died a few cycles back, best damn director I ever had. Sean is just a poor reflection of her work ethic, but he does try his best. By the end of the dinner, thanks to a drop of supplies from the chef, the vamps had settled down and were feasting on fresh meat while I got a warning on my cell. Jerome, VIP guest arriving at front counter. It was enough to make me feel like I needed to vomit. We use the term VIP a bit differently than most places because rather than meaning we consider them a valuable guest and appreciate their business, we recognize that when they arrive frequently here from the outside tends to follow. That's how the gate works. Every time a guest comes in for a short window of time, we are visible to the outside world and some of the better monster hunters out there have learned to spot it. I tried to remain calm as I rode the elevator to the bottom floor, checking a few other normal messages from housekeeping and food service. Nothing else was out of the ordinary for this crazy day, but something told me it wasn't going to stay that way. As the silver-plated doors opened and I saw the dark-haired woman in the red overcoat standing at the front counter, I knew that wasn't going to be possible. Valerie, I thought I told you that you couldn't come back here, I said as Jerome went to go attend to a crying imp near the vending machine. Theo, please you don't understand. I'm in real trouble this time, she told me as she placed her sunglasses on and I realized that she was soaked from head to foot. Tell me what happened, I urged her as I shuffled over to the side of the entrance. There was a raid in the bunker of Budapest. Some new militia is trying to eradicate my species. Theo, these people mean business. They want to make me extinct, she said softly as she shuddered, and her shining wings dripped water from under her coat. You flew here all the way from Budapest? I asked in shock. I didn't have a choice. I'm sorry. I know that things haven't been the best lately, but I didn't know where else to go. Roman said I could trust you, she said. I opened my mouth to chastise her when another brawl started near the front lounge, this time between two golems. The stony creatures were getting ready to tear down the entire structure if necessary, and I could feel my stomach twist in knots as I realized today was going to be a clusterfuck. 
Val, sit tight for now, okay? We will figure this out. I have to manage this place for a few hours. Come up with solutions, I said as I grabbed one of the magic daggers that we keep on emergency behind the front counter and ran to the lounge to get between the two monsters. Stop this right now, or I swear to God, I will turn you both into statues for my conservatory, I warned. Truth be told, I was scared to death. They might try to crush me. I had just gone through a body because of a security breach and Jerome had warned me not to get into any trouble while he worked on growing me another shell. But I couldn't just sit idly by as my establishment was torn to shreds either. The golems considered their options, ready to smash me to bits. Then, to my surprise, Valerie walked in holding a spell book. Immediately she started chanting and the monsters started yelling and cussing in their unique language. I was about to warn her to stop when they both froze, and she grabbed my hand and led me back to the lobby. I'm sorry I had to do that, Theo, but it looked like you needed the help, she said. I nervously looked at the golems and then toward the spell book. That sort of thing isn't allowed in here, you know that, if one of my guests sees that it's liable to stir up a riot. She didn't comprehend the danger she was putting me in. Instead, all she did was huff and exclaim, well, I'm sorry that I just saved your life. I told you that I would handle it, but as long as my two guests are fine, I guess it doesn't matter," I said with a sigh, trying to calm down. At this rate, I would die from stress. This book is the last in my family line, Theo. It's the reason that these idiots tried to kill me, she said, clinging to it. Fine, you can keep it, but don't go waving it around, I said as I waved to Jerome and told him to get her a room on the sixth floor. I had another mess to deal with. While I had been busy trying to calm the golems down, Sean had texted me and told me there was an issue with two vampires at the spa. When I arrived, he was already dead, and the two males were fighting over his body. It took a moment for my head to stop spinning and understand what had happened. Likely the one male was more light-sensitive than the other, and the use of the tanning booth had sparked some survival instinct inside him. Sean had likely seen the fight get started and tried to intervene. But when I knew better than to get in between two vampires that were in the middle of bloodlust, the only way this was going to be resolved would be if one got staked or if one of them beheaded the other. I watched as they clawed over Sean's body and snarled at each other, shrieking and defiant. The others in the spa area were clearly upset, but not making a move to leave. Maybe all part of the same coven, I thought. And then I had a radical idea. It was just crazy enough to work, and I knew my options were limited. I moved toward the fire extinguishers and took one out of the glass, careful to not draw attention to myself. One false move and my head could be on the ground alongside Sean's mangled body. Then I moved toward the stoic vampires that were watching the two males fight and decided to restore order. Listen up. If you can't behave yourselves, then I'm going to have to ice some of your harem over here. Do you understand me? I shouted. The one male seemed to make sense of my words, but the other was too enthralled with the fight to listen. I was petrified instead he would decide to make my head his new necklace. Human, stay out of this feud, the first vamp insisted. Wish I could, but this is my establishment and we have rules. You've already killed one of my staff, so you're lucky I haven't kicked you out. Now sit your asses down, I ordered pointing the extinguisher at one of the women standing near the wall. His eyes flashed worry and concern and I saw a hint of regret over his actions. But in that moment of hesitation, the other male struck. They were back at each other's throats before I could move, and it was all over a second later. The first vampire had won, using his brute strength to break his opponent in two and be covered in a triumphant bloodbath. Then, completely splattered in the remains of his enemy, he turned to me and begged for the safety of his coven. You are an honorable man, Mr. Sharp. My coven has done nothing wrong, he said. I was shocked that he had been able to overcome bloodlust so quickly. What is your name? I asked. Marius, he answered, bowing respectfully. I bit my lip, mulling over all of the options in my head. The security of my guest was first and foremost. Come to my office at 3.30 tomorrow, Marius. I have a job proposal I want to make with you. Fucking wizards, don't get me started about them. Their official title should be experts in being pain in the ass, but I guess that's too mouthy. I probably have an extreme dislike for them because they are always trying to kill me and the one under my employ is really no different, despite the fact that years back I made him sign an impenetrable life oath. I suspect, though, given how often he has been the crux of sticky situations, that the spell must not be as binding as I thought it was. 
But even so, when we did a video conference the day after Valerie arrived, I did my best to be cordial with the man. Roman, I see you've graced me again with my ex's presence, I said as I sat down in my wingback chair and looked out toward the snowy mountains. The feedback from wherever he was attempting to astral project was choppy, so he kept his responses short. A necessary evil. Because of the book, I guess? Yet houses untold power. So you thought what better place to hide it than my hotel? How sweet, I said dryly. Again, it was necessary. What is it? Forbidden magic, was all he said. Then I got a knock on my door. I'll have to call you back. His spirit faded away, and I responded to the knock, allowing Nadia, my head housekeeper, to enter. Forgive my intrusion, Master Sharp, but I was curious about the guest found in room 414. Did they require any special attention or meal? I opened my mouth to respond and then stopped myself short. I mentally ran through all the guests I had checked in today and realized I didn't have someone staying in that room. As you can imagine, given that my whole week has been filled with murders, conspiracies and blood, my heart dropped at the thought that something else was happening on my watch without my knowledge. But I couldn't let my staff know any of this. I'll be handling them personally. Thank you for sharing your concern, I told her. The thin Lamian nodded and slithered out of my office, giving me a moment's reprieve to step out to my balcony and get a smoke in. Shit is hitting the fan every day, huh? I nearly choked on my cigarette. A second later, Roman's apparition had returned. You were listening in on that? I asked accusingly. I'm always listening, Theo. Now, maybe you should get your head out your ass and realize that you are in up to your neck in problems, Roman remarked. I snuffed out the cigarette and then pointed an accusatory finger at him. I wouldn't be having this problem if the damned Solomonari weren't trying to stir up trouble again. So how about you talk to your people and tell them to call off this fey hunt? I snapped. You know I couldn't do that even if they did listen to them. But I wasn't even referring to the problem of Valerie. I was checking your logs. You have 236 Strigoi and 146 Moroi in your haven right now. That is a very volatile situation waiting to explode, wouldn't you agree? So far we've been able to handle it. There's a land war going on, and their covens need somewhere to stay until things settle down. Or would you prefer an all-out extermination of the local populace? I asked. I'm just pointing out the numbers as I see them. Things have remained rather balanced right now, but if there was something to tip the scales, Roman said with a slight cock of his head. I knew exactly what he was implying, but I didn't dare even wish that evil to happen right now. I just needed to focus on getting control of one situation at a time. Do something about my force field. Can you focus your magic on that, please? I said with a sigh. He faded away, and I made a mental note that I needed to amp up my security in my own private office. It left me a bit unnerved to think that he was able to watch my every move any time he wanted to. As much as I trusted Roman, I knew at the end of the day he was once working with the enemy. And maybe, just maybe, some part of him still was. With all of the problems he tallied up on my head, a faulty security system was the last thing I needed, I thought as I pressed for the elevator. And so was an uninvited guest. My mind ran through all the possible scenarios where this could have happened. None of them were good, but none of them were as bad as the reality when it was staring in my face. Inside room 414 was what looked like a regular nine-year-old little girl. Yet from her stance and the way she looked at me when I came in the room, I knew this child was anything but normal. Not to mention that there were two dead adults next to her, likely her mother and father. Who are you? I asked, feeling the air was a bit chillier in the room than it had been a second earlier. Chloe Garlander, she said with a squeak. I knew that she was doing her best to appear innocent, but I was immediately concerned. How did you get in here, Chloe Gardner? You know the answer to that, Mr. Sharp, she said sternly. Apparently she had decided that we weren't going to play games with each other. I was fine with that. I needed to know exactly what circumstances had led this newest nightmare to be on my doorstep. You're a dampier, child of a vampire and a human. A sin, according to the Strigoi, I commented as I crossed my arm. Which I'm guessing is what happened here. They tried to find you and your parents sacrificed themselves to save you. She only merely nodded. I suddenly realized why the security gate hadn't accounted for her. Her human blood hadn't set off any alarms. Yet another maintenance fix, I thought sourly as I sat down beside her and remarked. I suppose you expect my protection? It is what this place is renowned for, is it not? Chloe responded. And who, pray tell, is trying to do you harm? I countered. 
More like, who isn't, she said. I sighed and mulled things over in my brain, trying to decide the best course to take. It was not safe for her to stay here. This floor didn't have ample enough security for a girl her age, especially if the other vampires came hunting for her. Chances are that her scent was what stirred up earlier problems, I thought frantically. She wasn't going to be safe anywhere in the hotel, except perhaps. Come with me, I decided, taking her cold, dead hand and leading her out of the room. I knew getting to where we needed to go wasn't going to be easy, and as soon as I stepped into the hallway, I saw more Strigoi vampires moving toward us, and I told Chloe to keep behind me. Get ready to run, I urged her as I took out my firearm. It only had three silver bullets, and there were at least seven Strigoi in front of me. This was going to get messy. The vampires snarled and transformed into their half-bat-like forms, crawling and sprinting down the walls as we ran, and I aimed the weapon. Chloe screamed. I fired the first shot right as one of the vampires jumped in front of us, and he immediately turned to ash. Sweat was dripping down my face as we tumbled over the next, and I smashed my fist straight in his face. Then I twisted about and shot the third vampire, only in the wing this time. But it was enough to make him flail and shriek as we rushed toward the elevator. Frantically, I pressed for the button and turned toward the group of attackers as the girl hugged the sliding doors. We were cornered. Close your eyes, I told her as I prepared my final bullet. It might give her a few moments of solace before she was torn to shreds. Then I heard a high-pitched shriek and looked down the hall to see a massive wolf leaping toward the crowd. For a moment, I was full of shock and confusion. I didn't know whether to be ready for a new attack or a rescue. But all became clear a moment later as the wolf snatched two of the strigoi and tossed them toward the wall with a resounding thud. A moment later, the wolf transformed into a man, and I drew a sigh of relief. Marius, you scared me, I said, thankful that my new head of security was earning his keep. I will handle these scum. Leave the area, he ordered as he showed him fangs to the remaining strigoi. The elevator door opened, and I didn't hesitate to listen to his order, pulling Chloe in and riding toward the top. Why do they want to kill me? The Dampier asked weakly. I didn't have time to explain the intricacies of vampire politics to her, so instead I just summed it up. You broke a law by being born. Maybe when you are older you'll understand, I said as I reached the only place I knew she would be safe and knocked on the door. A few moments later, Valerie opened the door in only a robe and seemed shocked by my arrival. She blushed and said, I'm sorry, I was getting cleaned up. I need a favor, I said, gesturing toward the child. Can you watch her while I handle a few things downstairs, I asked. Val nodded and scooted the girl into the room. Is everything all right, Theo, she asked me. I thought of how I had just put a target on my back from the entire vampire hierarchy and sighed as I shuddered and told her, just keep the door locked. Running this place can be a real bitch sometimes, but it's ten times worse when there is a power outage. This week has been hell. From a fairy ex to a child hybrid that is stirring up an undead war, it's made me wonder when I'm ever going to catch a break. But the latest problem really was the icing on top of the cake. I was down in the gym, talking with one of the trainers, an orc named Balin, when the shortage happened. The entire room went dark, and I told no one to move. The first thing I thought of was the force field that keeps us safe from the outside world. Was it down too? A quick radio to Jerem told me no. We were still mostly safe. So then, what was the cause of this problem? Can you keep everyone in here? I asked Balin as I used my smartphone to shine light on the aggravated creature that had been using the space for leisure. The orc made a grunt, and I ordered Jerem to meet me in the lobby. Then a new problem presented itself. I was halfway down the hall, checking the windows when I saw that we had a full moon, and it hit me as to what might have happened. Those fucking werewolves were experiencing symptoms of moon madness. Since I was already dealing with hostile vampires, a pack of angry feral wolves was the last thing that I really needed. But when it rains, it pours. I went to my office and grabbed my gun and a few silver bullets. This time, I didn't want to be unprepared. Then I made for the generator. My hope was that it was just a few pups trying to play a prank. Nothing serious. Then I ran into a teenage Trent in the lobby, hunched over a wood elf and preparing to tear him to shreds. I guess I should have accounted for problems along the way, and a loaded revolver full of silver wasn't going to do shit. I gritted my teeth, realizing that the power outage had likely caused a problem with the magic seals on the foliage. Another reason I'm anti-magic, half the time the spells don't work right. Naturally, I tried to reason with the tree monster first. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. 
Then I saw the elf was wearing garbs that looked like they were made directly from his bark, and I knew the source of the hostility. Mr. Sharp, you have to help me, the elf insisted as I maneuvered my way around to the east side of the lobby. The trees snatched him up with their vines before I could make a decision and started to perform a stranglehold on the poor creature. I probably only had a few seconds to act before he was choked of all breath. My manner's first and most important rule is all the guests treat each other respect. And God damn it, this week it seems like no one wants to follow through. I finally reached the north entrance and told the elf to hang on. Stumbling in the half-darkened lobby, it wasn't easy to find what I was looking for. Then I felt the glass case and squeezed my hand together to form a fist, smashing it in and grabbing a hold of the axe inside. Is that some kind of magic axe? The elf said excitedly as I ran up and smashed it against the Trent's left foot. It's a tree dumbass, I said as I started to chop. Sweat rolled down my face as the Trent snarled and screamed, trying to swipe at me. One of its twisting branches scratched at my back and I fell to the ground, the axe sliding toward the front desk. Then it picked me up and started to twist its vines around me as well. Damn it, I don't have time for this, I said as I looked out toward the mountains and heard the howl of wolves. My instinct about the full moon had been right. In a matter of seconds, the tree monster was squeezing the life out of both of us. I didn't really see much way out for me, except by means of digestion. I took one last gasp of air as the foliage started to clog my throat. Then a sharp, massive bolt of metal smashed through the Trent's right eye, and immediately it dropped me. I collapsed to the floor and saw Marius standing near the elevator holding a crossbow, shouting for me to get the elf to safety. Two times this week he has saved my life, I thought as I rushed toward the axe instead. I must be getting rusty. I grabbed it up and started swinging again. The tree monster snarled again, trying to use what was left of its power to shoot up more roots from the ground below my lobby. Motherfucker, I snarled as I chopped hard and Marius reloaded his bow. Finally, the monster lost its footing and started to tumble down. It collapsed in front of me and I drew a sigh of relief, turning to Marius and telling him, I need you to come with me to the generator. We left the writhing Trent there as we stepped outside, cold night air seemingly more dangerous than before. I'm sensing at least four werewolves, my security chief told me as he loaded his bow again and I cocked my weapon. It was so quiet in the mountains. The danger could be anywhere. You go east, I told him as I hugged the west wall and started toward the generator. I could smell the piss trails. They were more feral than usual, even with the full moon. Something had really riled them up. Then I heard a low growl come from behind me and I froze. I slowly turned to see a wolf pup with its hair standing up staring me down. It could easily tear me to shreds, but it didn't. Was it trying to control its natural impulse? Then I realized that I knew this shapeshifter. It was the same hound that I had let eat that stranger. Where are your parents? I whispered. It didn't take long for me to find out. They both leapt from the roof of the generator right on top of me. But to my surprise, they weren't here to protect their young. Actually, they were standing between me and the young pup. The father stood on his hind legs and snarled. Something in that food they ate has messed them up. I frowned, realizing that I hadn't even thought to check the stranger for poisons. What had they been doing here anyway? They'll keep trying to destroy the force field until it kills them, the mother agreed. The way they stood and faced their young, I realized what was about to happen. This wasn't a family squabble. They were going to kill it just to protect the entire manor. I pulled back from the impending fight and entered the generator room, listening as the wolves went at each other and then calling Jerome on the walkie again. Remind me how to charge this thing, I asked him. He walked me through it as I tried my best to ignore the strong shrieks from just beyond the shed. Mentally, I made a note to beef up security out here. Then I heard the snapping of a spine followed by a yelp. I'll call you back, I said as I peered outside and swallowed a gulp of air. The young wolf had murdered his two parents and was now teamed up with his other siblings who also showed the same red eyes as the first. Surrender, they said together in unison. Something about the way they hissed caused a memory to prickle in the back of my brain. I felt cold and sweaty, but I raised my gun and fired at them anyway. At the same time, Marius was there, tossing me the crossbow and rushing toward the wolves. The first one fell easily, but it was a bloody mess. Marius transformed into a bat and distracted the second as I loaded the bow. Aiming it, I said a prayer that it would work and felt the mighty weapon push me back as it fired. Then my vampire security chief lifted the final wolf up and dropped him from the sky. He hit the ground with a bone-crushing smash. 
My lord, I think I might need to get a raise after all this nonsense, Marius commented as he checked the wolves to make sure they were all deceased. I hurried back and finished the steps to restart the generator. Then I watched as the force field reactivated and the power came back on. What is this? Marius asked as he leaned over and took out what looked like a small round device that had been in one of the wolf's mouth. I examined it and felt my stomach get hollow again. I recognized it immediately and knew what the source of all my problems had been. It all connected. Marius, I need you to get all the security team out here and make sure this area is safe. I ordered him as I slipped the device in my pockets and ran inside. I could feel my heart beating out of my chest, not only with fear but rage. I had foolishly let this trap spring right in front of my eyes just because of a pretty face, I thought. Well, now it was time for Valerie to tell me the truth. I didn't bother knocking this time. I used my manager key and opened her door, shouting, When were you going to tell me that the Solomonari were planning a full-scale attack on me? The room was quiet. Then I noticed a trail of blood. I slowly moved toward the bedroom and felt my world turned upside down as I saw Val there, clinging to life. What the fuck happened? I asked. She coughed up a little blood and squeezed my hand, too tired to talk. I sighed, realizing the child Dampier was gone, and so was that spell book she had foolishly brought in here. Looks like I'll have to keep you alive a little longer so I can chastise you, I thought as I dialed up the manor's physician. Luda, how soon can you break free of your chain? Dr. Luda is a great physician, if you don't mind the fact that he is a Dullahan. I think some people get a little freaked out when a headless man is the one treating them, but his hands are as nimble and caring as any practicing medical care professional beyond my wall. The only real problem is sometimes he has a tendency to require payment in advance, and right now I didn't have any shrunken heads lying around. I promise you the next time we hold a voodoo convention I will pay you back, I just need you to treat her, I told the brute as he examined Valerie. His gruff voice rattled in my head. This is the third time you failed to pay me sharp. Next time you do so, I will ignore your call. I rolled my eyes and checked her wings, worried that whatever had attacked her might have clipped her. Who is the doctor here? Luda snarled, brushing me away. I sighed and checked my messages. I had already told Jerome, Nadia, and Marius to be on the lookout for the girl. There was no telling what sort of trouble she might be in. But Jerome was busy cleaning up a Trent-sized problem in the lobby, and Marius claimed it was his time to rest since it was sunrise. Nadia didn't even respond, so that just told me she was likely salty that it was payday and I hadn't distributed checks yet, not like I wasn't a little busy. Slowly, Valerie started to come to her senses as Luda started a transfusion. As a fay, I knew that Val would require a certain type of copper-reduced serum that would help her heal faster, so I had run to my office to get that while two Moroi watched the room. It was nearly breakfast when she told me she was ready to talk about what happened. Luda made me sign some stupid paperwork about the need for advanced payment next time, and we were at last alone. Theo, are you all right? Are you hurt? She whispered. I'm more concerned about you. Tell me who did this. Is Chloe in danger? I responded. Her eyes seemed more crazed than before, as if she thought I was joking, and then she told me something I found almost unbelievable. The girl was the one who did this to me, she blurted out. I felt my whole body grow cold as I stared her down. You're sure? I whispered. Valerie sat up and gave me a nasty look. I know what an attack is. She waited until the blackout and struck me and stole my book. I thought about Roman's warning and then remembered my assumption about the contents of the tome. Valerie, who among the Solomonari gave you that book? I asked her. Now that she was recovering, it was pointless to beat around the bush, especially if there were danger. They worked alongside Roman before you cast that spell on him. I'm not entirely sure, she admitted. I bit my tongue, recalling that his house was especially angsty against the vampires, and a few final puzzle pieces fell into place. I think the spell was compromised. The Solomonari sent you here as a trap for that book to be taken. They wanted you to feel safe before they did so, I told her. But I had it the whole time until the blackout, she pointed out. I knew it was a bad idea to let those vampires come here. I said sourly to myself, realizing that they had likely been so angry, not just because of the dampier, but because of the forbidden magic that the book held. It was a threat to them, which means it's a threat to all of us, I thought as I contacted Marius and told Val to not go anywhere. We need to have a full perimeter sweep for a nine-year-old girl, Jerome asked when I met him in my office. I had taken steps to make sure that Roman couldn't astral project and listen in, 
But even so, I was feeling extraordinarily paranoid because of being tricked by a child. This is not a mere kid. She's a threat. She has stolen a power spell book. I'm not sure what she wants it for, but we can't let her leave with it, I told my old friend. We had seen many battles together. He was the one I trusted implicitly, and I saw that he was afraid. We hadn't dealt with a threat like this in a while. Maybe we had become rusty. Marius interrupted us a moment later with a report. The covens are becoming restless. They sense that magic is being used on the grounds and they are turning on each other, he said frantically. I could even see that the strange incantations were hurting him as his fingernails were forming into claws and his appearance was disheveled. He was doing his best to keep things running despite the setback, but it was clear we were all on edge, all because I had been tricked. Let's put the pieces together to solve this puzzle. It might make things easier, Jerome told the both of us. I was thankful he was trying to be the voice of reason. One, the Solomonari attacked Fey and vampires in different sovereign areas in order to send them here, knowing that you will offer them solace, correct? I've never turned down a guest in over a hundred years that I know of, I said with a nod. Two, they seem to have their hearts set on acquiring an ancient tome filled with black magic, the kind of which is considered to be extremely dangerous for vampires, and they enlisted the aid of an undetectable dampier to acquire the book, Jerome added. Sounds to me like whoever is behind this has some knowledge of the future, an advanced warlock or something, Marius suggested. This means the vampires must be the target, they are using the Dampier because they know that she will have a natural hatred against them due to their belief that she is a curse. So then their aim must be to leave undetected the same way they got in, Jerome reasoned. The logic sounded like it was foolproof, so I told Marius to focus on the outer grounds and Jerome, and I kept the covens as separated as possible as the search continued. By midday, we still hadn't found the girl, and I was becoming increasingly worried. What if she had already made it out with no one noticing? But then I remembered how the vampires were acting. They could hardly control their feral urges. The magic spells that the Dampier was trying to revive were increasing in strength. Let me help, Val insisted when I went to check on her. I feel awful that I didn't recognize that Roman was compromised. I led this whole mess straight to your front door, she added. I checked her wings again and said, How much dust do you have available? Valerie seemed surprised by my suggestion and spread her fey wings to full length. They shimmered in the afternoon glow of the mountain sun. I had forgotten how beautiful they were. Gentle glints of fairy dust started to spread as she fluttered and said, I can probably make a few rounds. The dust should be able to detect some kind of trail for the magic. I encouraged her to do so and watched as she used her window to fly out, speeding around the massive haven as she let her dust scatter. She returned 15 minutes later, looking exhausted and drained. Did you do too much? I asked anxiously. She shook her head and closed her eyes, focusing on what the remnants of her body were whispering to her. I remained dead silent so not to interrupt. Then she grabbed my arm and gasped, the basement. My blood ran cold. I realized immediately what this young vampire was up to. Thank you, Valerie, I said, kissing her cheek and running to the elevator. There wasn't a moment to lose, or even to call for help. I used my manager's key and turned the lock on the transport to get me to the bottom of my secure room where I kept my bodies. As soon as I arrived, the elevator shook and lost power, a clear sign that someone nearby was draining it. I stepped out and instantly felt a migraine hit me. The room was shrouded in dark clouds and miasma. And in the middle, Chloe Garlander was sitting cross-legged and chanting. I did my best to not stumble as I approached. She was so engrossed in the text, she didn't see me. I only had one chance and I took it. I grabbed up the tome and closed it tight, the room immediately clearing. Chloe's eyes opened, dark as night. She looked pissed. Undoubtedly she was. Mr. Sharp, you're a shrewd one, she said, standing up and snarling her fangs at me. But I don't think you have it in you to kill a child. You're no more a child than I am a mere man. Give me one good reason to not use this stake and bore it into your cold, dead heart. I spat back evenly as I reached for the weapon on my belt loop. She blinked considering my offer, and then snarled, What if I told you that I work for a more dangerous enemy than you think? True, the Solomonari hired me to stir war between the covens and to take down your haven. But those two goals aligned so perfectly with my own, I didn't see a reason to not take the job, Chloe answered. You think if you give me this information, I will let you live? I asked. I think that you don't have a choice. Look around, Mr. Sharp. Haven't you noticed that something is missing? She said evenly. 
for the first time since the magical fog had lifted, I did look, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks. The shells, the bodies were all gone. Now you needn't worry. I simply relocated them for a temporary time, but it would be most unfortunate for you if anything happened between now and then, wouldn't it? She said wickedly. Her card had been played, and I didn't have a leg to stand on. If you didn't come to kill me, then why are you here? I asked in confusion. I had been so sure I understood the intricate details of this plot against my haven, but each step forward felt like I was going in reverse. So simple-minded, she said with a cackle. There is no need to destroy you or your precious haven. Now, let me go, and I will reveal my true purpose for stirring up so much trouble, Chloe insisted. I mulled over the options and realized I didn't have a choice. She had already proven how dangerous she was. Fine, but that's only going to work one way, I said as I opened up the spell book and found a teleportation enchantment. Her eyes widened in alarm as I chanted the words. Then the room filled with smoke and light as she screamed, and the dampier was gone. An hour later, I informed Jerome of the situation downstairs and instructed Valerie to destroy the spell book. I will have to travel far to do that. We might not see each other for a while, Theo, she said as she prepared to leave. Given that you always seem to cause trouble when you come, maybe that's for the best, I said with a half grin. She huffed and we embraced before she flew off. The spell that Chloe had used to enrage the vampires wore off a few hours later and I kept myself locked in my quarters until then. I felt so fragile and vulnerable without my shells, but it still puzzled me to no end the purpose of this entire game. If she had not been trying to kill me, what purpose did all of this serve? I wondered. It all felt like a game, and I was two steps behind. Jerome came to give a report around midnight. Which do you want first, sir? Good news or bad? He asked. It was rhetorical, but I went ahead and told him good. The covens are calm, and the bodies have returned. I dreaded the bad, but he told me anyway. It would seem one of the shells is missing, he said as he swallowed a gulp of air. But I leave you'll see what my goal was Chloe had said. Now it all made sense. Someone was after the immortality factor of my shells, and they had played me like a fiddle. Sir, what should be our next move? Jerome asked. I bit my lip and looked out the window, still uncertain who to trust anymore. We prepare for everything. 